Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, As you're all aware and uh, We've talked to our guest today and let him know Dr. Craig Harper is with us and uh, is one of the, the principal investigators on the, the Big Tennessee project that's ongoing. And we're talking in particular about uh, this idea that, that we may want to consider moving the season dates later in our harvest frameworks. And uh, there, there's a lot of really interesting work being done and some of that work is is uh some that you're engaged in in tennessee craig so we we really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us about this i know this is a really popular issue and uh people are really concerned about it and and i think it's with good reason and and thank you for taking time to come tell us about what you've been doing and and uh how it relates to that issue no problem always glad and fun to talk to both of you looks like Y'all found a comfortable place in the library there to set up for the for the podcast. Are you sure you're not causing too much racket in the in the library there? <laughs> They've just just a few times, but oh well. Yeah, they actually <laughs> put quiet signs facing out around us so that everybody else stays quiet. Is, is that so that, is that can... uh, grizzly above you from the Auburn area, or where'd that come from, Will? North Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> Right on the Tennessee border. <laughs> you, you shot it beside a Black Panther, I bet. I did. I actually got both of them. <laughs> yeah, the, that, the Black Panther rug is at home, but but <laughs> Neva wouldn't let me put the bear bear rug in there, so it didn't match the decor. <laughs> well, it looks like y'all are having too much fun here with your podcast, so that's good. Yeah, we've certainly been having a lot of fun. There's no question. Well, uh, yeah, so, so Craig, um, you know, everybody, I, I, sh- I guess I shouldn't say everybody, but most people I think have heard you talk before, especially on a variety of, uh, habitat management issues, you know, whether it be for wild turkeys or white tailed deer, or Northern bobwhite. Um, but you're also involved in this, uh, like we, like Marcus just mentioned, this big TWRA study, um, that involves some season date manipulation and measuring, uh, turkey productivity responses. Um, would you tell us a little bit about kind of the origin of that study and the thought process and designing it? Yeah, well, in the around 2015, 2016, uh, there had been a lot of concern about the turkey harvest declining, especially in South Middle Tennessee and, and what is in Tennessee in the southern portion of, of Region 2. And so TWRA approached me and and Dave Bueller and asked us about conducting a study to look at the reasons why the turkey harvest was declining and and perceived population decline in the area. Uh, You can't immediately assume that the population is in decline when the harvest declines, but that's, you know, intuitive. And so uh, we began the study in 2017 and it's still going on now. And we've had some changes along the way in terms of of direction uh, with regard to what we're specifically looking at. But the whole time we've looked at uh, productivity of the birds, you know, the nest, the brood survival, of course, habitat use, adult survival. And we followed over, uh, I think, 400 hens. We try to have at least uh, 100 hens on, on air each year. And so we have nearly 700 hen days, you know, if you include the hens that have remained on air uh, over multiple years or that we have recaptured. And so we've gotten a lot of information through the course of the study. 
And in the last two years, you know, with the consideration and concern over season setting dates, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency Commission, they voted to delay the opening of the Tennessee turkey season by two weeks in 2021, in the spring of 2021. Uh, in three of the counties that we're working in. So we're working in five counties. In three of the counties, there had been a decline in harvest. And in adjacent two counties, there had not been a decline in harvest. And so they implemented a two-week delay in the season opener in those three counties in which there had been a decline. And so now we've been able to collect data for two years with regard to uh, hens nesting, the timing of nest initiation, uh, hatchability, poults per nest, et cetera, et cetera, in those counties that experienced the two week decline versus the other two counties that had not had a reduction in harvest and there was no delay in the season opening in those counties. And so now for the uh, past two years, we've had an experiment where we've been able to look at any effect delaying the season opener by two weeks may have in those counties. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a powerful design. Um, I don't know, Marcus, if you want to get right into those results, but one of the things that stood out to me that Craig was saying is that, uh, you know, they, this, they've been collecting this data for six years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's really commendable. You don't have, yeah. you know, many turkey research projects where the funding agency is even interested, you know, mm -hmm. for funding it for that long, much less, you know, also having, you know, PIs that are interested in conducting the work for that length of time. Yeah. And, and the sample sizes on right. top of the manipulative studies design is so rare. Right. Having both. Over yeah, long term. I'm looking at the numbers now. Uh, as of this year, we've tracked 446 hens, uh, 642 hen years, if you will. Um, and right at 600 nests monitored. And, and let me also say uh, the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency certainly is to be commended for not only funding the project, but also they have put a lot of skin in the game with helping with trapping and securing sites. You know, in each of those five counties, we have two sites. So we have 10 sites in which we're uh, looking at all this and, and the, the folks with TWRA have, have helped immensely, both the, the field personnel as well as the uh, administrative folks. And I'm not saying that to try and get more money out of them here on the podcast. <laughs> maybe this I was going to say that sounds like way more work than, you know, even the yeah. most devoted graduate student would be able to capable of handling by themselves. Yeah, for sure. And we've, we've had two master's students and a PhD student on the project and the second master's student and the PhD student are, they'll they'll be finishing up next year okay so i think we really want to get into the results related to season dates but before we go there um craig can you share like any of the any key takeaways that you think have resulted from having such an extended data set i mean you know particularly related to ups and downs in reproduction and reproductive success because you know marcus and i t and i'm sure you do too talk to people all the time that talk about up and down hatch years and the places that they hunt and the places that they frequent. Um, is that something that you guys got a good feel for over that period of time? Yeah, the, of course, the, the nest success has fluctuated. Uh, poult survival, of course, has, has fluctuated. You have good years and you have poor years, but in general, you know, we're in the mid twenties with regard to nest success, you know, 26 to 8% somewhere in that neighborhood and poult survival also somewhere around 20% overall. Uh, some years are poor and, and some years, you know, might bump at or above 30%. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's, you, you have to look at things like this over as long of a period as you can because of that annual variability. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing 10% swings up, up to 10% swings in poult survival, like 20 to 30% from one year, to the, or, to or, the next or, or even greater. Are you, uh, I remember okay. one year that overall poult survival was was at or just below ten percent. 
Okay. So, so you, you can see huge swings in either of those over the course of time. And what about nest success? What is the range in that parameter that you've seen? Around 20 to 40 percent, something okay. like that. But overall average is in the mid 20s. Okay. But in some years, it's doubled. Yeah. I mean, so I think that that's just further emphasizes the importance of monitoring turkey populations across longer time spans. Yeah, and I, I think what, Craig, what you said is some, a take-home message that people need to, you know, internalize is that the variation on the same site, even when, you know, from year to year when nothing changed, is still very, it's highly variable. And you have to put that in context when you're thinking about some of these studies, uh, you know, you need to do it over a longer term and have it well replicated and designed to account for the fact that things just vary a lot from year to year anyway. So it's, you know, if it's a shorter term study and less well replicated, yeah. some treatment effects may not actually be treatment effects yeah. if they're, you're not fully yeah. really capturing and, that. And I might add, we also observed considerable year to year variability and hatchability which was uh which of course is the percentage of eggs that hatch and and it was it was actually more than than I would have expected when we looked at hatchability among the study sites and only using those years with adequate sample sizes of successful initial nest and not including renests which we all know can be uh, relatively low compared to the initial nest we observed hatchability range from uh, 73% to 97% year to year. And that was both in the delayed and non-delayed counties and both before and after the delay. And when you say the percentage of eggs that hatch, you mean the percentage of eggs that obviously aren't, that make it through the entire incubation period that hatch, right? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to clarify yeah, that. that. Well, yeah. that, that's really interesting. Because I know the average has been reported to be around 75% is the number that I've heard multiple times mm -hmm. and it's just one year of data. And we know that from what we just talked about, there's a lot of annual variability in that rate, but granted last year in Alabama, that's what we saw was yeah. about 75%. Yeah, yeah. So if we look at all counties, all sites, all years, the hatchability average is 87%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, in thinking about your, your study design and why, at least one of the major thrusts of the study is to look at that season framework. Uh, you know, what, what's your feeling on how the, the season change has affected the different parameters that you're monitoring? Right now, as of 2022, this past year, after two years of the delay, we haven't seen any. Um, the incubation initiation dates remain extremely consistent and i'm talking about like within three days so the median incubation initiation date from 2017 to 2022 is from april the 25th to april the 30th so so five days mm -hmm. so uh it, it goes you know 25 26 25 27 25 30 so it's it's very consistent with regard to uh, nest initiation. And okay. that's true in, in all the counties. In the uh, non-delayed counties in the past two years, uh, the median incubation initiation date was April 27th and May the 2nd. In the delayed counties, it was April 24th and April the 30th. So uh, it, it's all just right there within a couple of days that's tight yeah. and and there's there's as much variation or more between years as it is between delayed or non-delayed counties yeah yeah so you mentioned that on the delayed counties they moved the season date back two weeks so what what became the new start date following the delay well and this is interesting in tennessee from what i can gather from twra the Tennessee turkey season has opened on the Saturday closest to April the 1st since 1986 or 87. And the annual bag limit has been four birds until a couple of years ago. And that was reduced in uh, 
some of the experimental counties as well as some counties in West Tennessee that had experienced a lot of flooding. And, and so our season open date has been consistent for, you know, 40 plus years. So the, the actual date, uh, you know, it changes because it's the first Saturday sure. closest to April the 1st, but it's two weeks later. So on average, you know, you're looking at around April the 14th or 15th, something like that. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that's, that, that change pretty closely aligns with the recommendation made in the ISBEL paper mm-hmm. that came out of the Southeast Wild Turkey Working Group, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that suggested that, you know, if season timing and, you know, intensive early harvest of males in spring is interfering with reproduction, that ideally you would delay the season opening till the median incubation date. But that probably mm-hmm. wasn't palatable to hunters, right? So mm-hmm. they said that the next best thing would be to initiate it when hens start laying. And that should be, you know, if you're if you're having average incubation date towards the end of April, you back up two weeks and that's about where you guys are at. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, the median incubation date is is gonna be in that fourth week of April, uh, April 25, April 26, 25, 27, 25, 30. So there's the median dates for the right. past six years. And so if you didn't open turkey season in Tennessee until April the 25th, there's going to be some unhappy folks. Right. That's what the working group was <laughs> saying. And they were saying, so the best next option would be to, to move it back at least until most hens started laying. They initiated laying, which is when and, y'all, y'all would be at now, right? With and, two weeks and before. See, what is interesting to me is what happened to the turkey population from 1986 or 87 all the way until 2015, 16, when the population began to, to level off. And so it, it increased like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it went up dramatically with no change in the season opening date or the annual bag limit. Yeah, and no- so in the face of the season opening at that time, Tennessee experienced a tremendous increase in the turkey uh, in the turkey population, and obviously in the uh, the turkey harvest. Yeah. So, uh, just, so obviously, opening the season at that time did not prevent the population from increasing to tremendous levels all across the state. Uh, you have shown several graphs and things showing these these different data, and we're planning to make those available online for for people so you can actually see the data visually on on these graphs that you've walked through i think that's a really important point and uh you know that you did see that this steep incline so an increasing population of the you know turkeys in tennessee during that time of the initial framework and i thought also want just to make sure that i heard you correctly and to reiterate you're that you don't see any uh at least initial even these first couple of years after the the change for to two weeks later you have not seen a corresponding change in when hands initiated their nests is that accurate yes that's true we, we have we have not we have not seen anything yet okay and, and, and i just shared my screen so you can see the uh statewide spring turkey yeah. harvest uh, by region in Tennessee. And if I go back a couple of slides and, and I can send this to you, this is, you know, simply the, the statewide harvest data. Mm-hmm. You can see that trend, how it has gone over time from 1990 till uh, at least to 2021. And, and Tennessee harvested a record, all time record number of birds in, in 2020. And so, you know, you, you could, you could make equal argument that, we should increase the bag limit or hunter availability to uh, a broader range of, of dates as opposed to decrease it when, when you're killing a record number of birds. And, and yeah. even last year, uh, it wasn't a record season, but it was still in amongst some of the top years ever with regard to tur- turkey harvest in Tennessee. So yeah. overall, uh, Tennessee turkey hunters should be very happy. Uh, yeah. I, I think we have obviously reached a plateau of where the turkey population is going to go. And and I just had one of the graduate students do this recently is put the human population in Tennessee on the same graph 
as the turkey harvest uh, date. Yeah. And the human population, <laughs> it's still doing this. It, it's yeah. not plateauing off. And so when you think of how much habitat there was available to turkeys through the 80s, 90s and, and into 2000, uh, you know, 10 or 11, when we were reaching those initial peaks, think of how much less habitat there is statewide now from from what there was in 2010 or 11 with all of the increase in human population and the associated infrastructure of buildings and roads and, and everything else, it, you, you can't go back and have equal numbers of birds of, of an all time uh, level when the birds have less area to inhabit. And so I, I think that has to be taken into account, particularly in some states that, that have experienced such huge uh, human population increases. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Craig, just, I, I can't see the, the numbers from where I'm sitting. That red line that you have uh, perpendicular to the blue. Yeah, that's, that's simply an, an arbitrary line showing uh, what we call the, the restoration phase previous to that. Yeah, okay. When, you know, when, when of course, uh, birds were still being uh, captured and, and uh located in, in other places where they were trying to, to build the population and then into the quote maintenance phase. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. Marcus, you need to get your eyes checked cause I can see that just fine, but I can see the stuff. But I can't <laughs> read the numbers on it. And I did get my eyes checked yesterday and, and I'm still having some adverse <laughs> issues about that. So, but uh, what's interesting to me about it though, is he's got that line drawn at 2005 and that's the exact year that so many of these States, including Alabama, which I'm most obviously familiar with, you know, saw, you know, either peak harvest or, or the beginnings of declines. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, stays relatively consistent plus or minus a few years across most of our Southeastern States. Yeah. But you well, know, seeing this figure, it looks to me like you know, almost a, a classic, uh, you know, case study of uh, of a population that goes through um, exponential growth and then reaches some carrying capacity and fluctuates yeah, around was, that point. That's what I was about to say. Is it looks a lot like what we teach a carrying capacity curve, to sure. like, which well, we're also going to. You look at some states, and and not, I haven't analyzed uh, data from from all these other states, but especially states such as Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, uh, Virginia, and North Carolina, they're still on the increase. But if you look, that increase is beginning to lessen. And so I would predict that it's not gonna be long at all before those states start seeing this, this plateau effect also mm -hmm. where they're, they're, they're simply holding as many birds as they're going to. Do you think, I mean, the initial thought that goes through my mind when you said that is that I mean, is it possible? I don't know anything about the restocking history of those states compared to Tennessee, Alabama, or Georgia. But was it was it a, a more recent occurrence so that those populations would still be in this exponential growth phase? Tennessee has worked to restock birds for for many years. I don't know that Alabama, for example, did that prior to Tennessee. But perhaps the amount, the number of birds was was greater. But but certainly the turkey population in Alabama established much sooner than Tennessee's did. And same thing for Kentucky, North Carolina, for example, they didn't see those increases in uh, harvest until much later years. And I mm -hmm. think that is really a result of the restocking efforts, at least whether it be uh, when they were doing it or the numbers of birds that were being relocated. I, I think the relocation in those states was going on um, much later than in Alabama, for example, because they already had well-established populations in most areas of the state. That makes sense. Yeah. It's really interesting. Well, uh, Craig, and I, I think everybody probably listening to this knows that, that uh, your expertise is is uh really centered in habitat stuff or at least that's what i've always viewed you as uh being that expert i know you've done turkey centric work as long as i've known you i think all the way back to your graduate studies uh focused on turkeys and i know that you were a passionate hunter of turkeys and and uh take take advantage of opportunity whenever you get the chance uh 
Nobody sets my calendar but me, Marcus. So as long as you let, as long as you continue to allow all these other people set your calendar, you're not going to get to turkey hunt that much. Yeah. Well, I, I've been I've been taking notes watching you over the years. Uh, I'm I'm definitely taking that to heart that I need to make sure that I, you know, take advantage of of uh, opportunity at any 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 time that I can. But the uh, reason I wanted to preface with that is one of the things I think that has emerged as a concern, uh, you know, that that's definitely relevant to the hunting season framework discussion, uh, is this idea that, that, uh, we, we might see hens nest later. And there's some work that has shown that, uh, late nesting hens tend to be less productive and successful than, than early nesting hens and regardless of of that part of the argument at, from your perspective from a, as a habitat expert you know could could you walk us through i guess uh what a poult would face if it was born let's say quote during the the normal time versus if you delayed that 3 weeks or a month you know uh, in terms of the habitat change and and what the poult is having to overcome to survive through that are there any things that are that are changing uh, to be negative for the, the yeah bulb? with plant communities or insect yeah, communities like pl- plant productivity or or uh, the structure or insect production you know those sorts of things? Um, well, that's a good question. Of course, we do extensive vegetation work in in all these studies and a lot of vegetation work in studies, for example, that are looking at the effects of fire or the effects of silviculture when there are not turkeys transmitted. It's not a you know turkey project per se, but looking at the vegetation response to, to different management practices. Um, if you're looking at the vegetation condition in the woods or, or woodlands where you have less than 50 percent sunlight coming into the stand you know in, in closed canopy conditions you're going to have you know typically three to five percent sunlight coming into the stand and you don't get that much of an understory response until you allow a minimum of 20 percent into the stand and of course a little better at 30 percent but at that level of sunlight the change in vegetation density or height in the understory is is going to be negligible from you know for example late may early june to late june early july something like that so i mean we, we've done you know all kinds of, of measurements through the summer looking at that type of thing and, and you're not going to see that much change now in in more open conditions where you have at least 50 percent sunlight coming in or of course in early successional areas where you may have uh, up to 100% sunlight into old fields and, and that kind of uh, vegetation community, then you, you can certainly see more of a change with regard to the the height of the vegetation, not so much change with regard to the density of the vegetation because, for example, if uh, there's a lot of grass growth, that that density at ground level presented by the grass is is going to be just as dense in late May, early June as it would be in late June, early July. Uh, and, and with the forbs, you're going to have X number of plants that have germinated and are growing. And by late May, they already are, you know, it, it could be anywhere from, according to which plants, uh, one to two feet tall, something like that but the density of them is going to be consistent uh, from then until you know, early July. You're not going to see necessarily an increase in the density of plants, um, but certainly you, you will see an increase in, in the height of the vegetation. So the height of the vegetation certainly may influence the hens. Uh, more typically, they like to be in areas where they have better visibility. And so when you have a whole lot of uh, uh, vegetation that's blocking visibility and such that the hen can't see it's it's that uh, dense and thick you typically won't see that much 
uh, use. And, and that's certainly what we have seen in this turkey study. The majority of brood locations when they are in or around early successional communities or along the periphery or the edges of those openings, if the vegetation is so dense that it's causing problems with the poults getting uh, into those openings. And you'll see them use the, the forest and woodlands more, the adjacent forest and woodlands more in, in those situations. Uh, we do see more use of the fields when the structure of the vegetation at ground level is such that mobility of the of the of the poles is, is good and they can get through the area and, and hens have uh, good visibility. And so that's where your your management comes in. And so I would say that the usability of early successional areas certainly could be different from late May to early July, but the understory vegetation in forest and woodlands with certainly less than, you know, 30 or 40 percent vegetation, you're not going to see that much of a difference in those. That might have been a long way around to answer the question, but. Hopefully, I no. So basically, <laughs> no. No, that's that's good stuff. And I mean, I, <laughs> and I think in a lot of areas we're more reliant on vegetation and woodlands to provide brooding habitat for turkeys, just because yeah. early, true early successional well, areas are so limited across the landscape. Well, Craig, I was, did, you measured the availability of early succession right in in the study uh, in the the counties. What what percentage of the landscape was in that early succession? Do you remember? Um, hmm, I can look right quick. I remember, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It was a staggering statistic yeah. that I felt was, like he I'm shared with me before about the, the rate of selection for early succession versus availability across the yeah. landscape. If I, yeah, recall, I've got, no, I got numbers in mind, but I'll look, so I'm not giving you something wrong. The, uh, the amount of, of early succession is well, you know, like old field areas, about 3%, and uh, shrubland, 4.5%. And so, you know, most of these counties, 38% uh, deciduous forest, about 8% pine or cedar, but uh, pasture hay, 34%, row crop, 5%. So, you know, it, it's a lot of open ground, but most of it is, you know, working lands in, in hay or, or pasture and, and some row crop. But the... Uh, the percentage of nest in either early succession or shrubland is 45 percent when you know that's seven percent of the landscape roughly right together is excuse that, me that was seven percent together of the landscape that's right but at and 45 percent of the nests are, are concentrated where that where that type of cover is available mm -hmm. so turkeys like that <laughs> I, would, I would i would venture so far to say so yeah one may conclude <laughs> well that was just like marcus you know i was uh, i was sharing that study with you that in their modeling exercise they found that the the top model that was predicting i think it was occupancy by gobblers was availability of early succession mm -hmm. and it only represented about seven percent of the landscape yeah. very consistent i remember it was when you told me the number yeah. i was thinking man i think that was the same thing from the tennessee study yeah the same percentage of the landscape right so and i mean our our nest success was was relatively high in those communities as well um yeah. you know at about 36 percent that was the that's those nests in early succession experienced the greatest success of others. Uh, the nest success in, in woods, for example, where pine or deciduous around 30% and in shrubland 26% uh, and all of the other vegetation types less than less than 20%. Mm -hmm. So that, that type of cover obviously is, is important for nesting, but it's not necessarily good for brooding because many of those those early successional areas are so dense, especially with grass, that uh, it you know poles literally can't can't navigate through that. Mm -hmm. And so you know we're we're seeing all the time that these broods are using around the edges of those openings and in yeah. the woods. So is that just to be clear to the audience that when you're saying grass, is that primarily like fescue and th those types of well, grasses, or is it another? 
native grass. M most most of the fields, of course, do have non-native grasses, and the number one non-native grass in, in this area would be, or the most prevalent one, would be tall fescue. We also have uh, Bermuda grass. We have a fair amount of, of orchard grass, uh, other non-native grasses, of course, Johnson grass and Dallas grass. But look, it even, even if it's native grass, whether it's uh, broom sedge or big blue stem, Indian grass, little blue stem, switch grass, you know, whatever, you know, grass is grass if you've got too much of it. If, if it's just so dense and cluttering up the, the space at ground level, it, it's not good. And so concentrating more on forbs is hugely important, not only for the mobility, but there are many more insects and other invertebrates associated with forbs than with grasses. Mm -hmm. Grasses are so high in lignin content that you don't see nearly as many invertebrates in grass dominated communities as you do in forb dominated communities. Mm -hmm. But even, even with that, the, the height of some forb uh, communities may be too high and the density of some forb communities may be too dense to allow good mobility, uh, germination from the seed bank. And according to how it's been managed, you still might have, you know, a lot of litter where, you know, a lot of the seed is, is less available than if the, uh, the, open space was greater at, at, at ground level, you know? So the management of these sites is critical. And, and another interesting thing that I got Lindsay, Lindsay Phillips, she's a PhD student to, to calculate, is what percentage of these nests were being destroyed by mowing, you know, because mowing for most landowners is, is the practice that they use to, you know- Well, that's how you fields. manage fields, right? You keep fields open instead of letting them grow up in, in whatever. And so 12% of the nests that occur in either early succession, uh, food plots, hay fields, pastures, row crop, 12% are destroyed by mowing alone. That, that's huge. You know, if you could <laughs> increase your nest success potentially by at least 10 percent simply by not getting on the tractor and <laughs> mowing fields during the nesting season. Hello. That, that's, a, that's a big deal. Well, that, that, I don't even logically see why that would would occur. I mean, if you don't mow during nesting or you mow during nesting, that's a problem. <laughs> so, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? Don't don't mow the places that they like the most. You got seven percent of your landscape yeah. in this, and then you mow it during nesting when the hens have selected that disproportionately. Yeah, yeah, and you've mowed down the best place to have the nest, and did it while there all the nests were in it. That's you directly right. destroyed the nest on top of that. Yep. And it's funny to me how many people are willing to give mowing a pass, but then they're so critical of burning during nesting yeah. season, you know, oh, you yeah, feel we like can't you, even burn one right, nest up right. and, or, you know, it goes, which I'm not saying we shouldn't off. be cognizant of timing of burning right. in that regard, but well, the, it's just that mowing doesn't get that same reputation. And, and furthermore, I think, um, mowing, you know, not only potentially negatively destroys nest, but you're increasing grass density and that and mm -hmm. increasing the thatch layer with mowing at the same time. Yeah. which is negatively affecting habitat quality on down the road as well. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not just landowners, you know, even state agencies, they, they still are not all of them, but, but many of them and in many places uh, within certain state agencies, they're, they're still mowing openings as a way of keeping those openings open. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hey, I've, I've been there. I, I used to be a professional mower. That really was my job <laughs> with a state agency as a wildlife technician. You know, from May through September, that's all I did. I got on yeah. a tracker and I mowed. I mowed and mowed and mowed. I, I mowed up fawns. I mowed up uh, turkey <laughs> nest. I mowed up rabbits and songbirds. Uh, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm riding around on a tractor with a wildlife patch on my on my arm. You know, what, what am I doing? I remember one time I just stopped the tractor and I thought, you know, what am I doing? I, I am because of a reduction in the fall uh, recruitment of, of many of these animals. And, of course, I started asking questions and they didn't like that. But uh, I didn't expect you know, a confessional you, today. You need to start asking some questions. Yeah. This, is, this is bad management. Let's yeah. just call it what it is. Yeah. Why do I not? have any turkeys but i have all these feathers everywhere 
So if, 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 you, about you know, the if you've fields. got to mow, if you can't burn, if you can't disc, you know, et cetera, uh, at, at least try to hold off your mowing until, you know, mid to late winter. You know, that that cover also is needed for many species during the wintertime. Yeah. But if you can hold off your mowing until that time of year, which which makes mowing actually so much easier because you don't have all of the biomass on top of the ground, you know, mm. uh, as you do during the middle of the growing season, just hold, holding your mowing off until that time of year can be, uh, can make a huge effect with regard to the, the cover that is available during the reproductive season. Yeah. But even better, you would start using fire to set back those areas instead of mowing in most cases, right? Yes, we, can, we yeah. just finished a study. Bonner Powell was the master student comparing uh, deer forage, Bob White foods, openness at ground level, species richness of plants, et cetera, et cetera, in early successional areas that were mowed versus uh, uh, fire, you know, side mm -hmm. by side. And uh, that, that paper is about to come out in, in the Wildlife Society Bulletin. But uh, dramatic differences with regard to forage availability for deer, structure for nesting or brooding for turkeys, uh, food availability for Bob White. So, so yeah, I mean, and that's not, you know, Shazam, a real re revelation, but it is good to have uh, yeah. a lot of rep, uh, a lot of replicated sites with, with sound data showing, okay, folks, you know, here's the difference that, that mowing versus fire provides. And, uh, and, you know, fire in general is, is better. But even but if you can't burn. All, all that being said, all that being said, it's not that you, you shouldn't ever mow there. You know, there's reasons for, for mowing in some places at some times, uh, for example, and, and I know we can't go into all of that, but uh, even if you're burning all the time, when, how often, what time of year you burn, it can strongly, it strongly influence the plant composition and so you can ultimately go to just, you know, a field full of, of, uh, of native grass, or you can go to a field full of nothing but goldenrod or a field full of nothing but blackberry. And so knowing how your management affects the plant composition is, is huge. And so no one thing is going to solve all that. The, the best management is going to involve, you know, fire, discing, herbicides, perhaps mowing it at some point in time, et cetera. Well, I, I think one of the take-home messages, and you kind of keyed in on it with fire, which for some reason this time I didn't key in on that particular thing. Uh, I keyed in on a different aspect, but you know, this is something that's pretty simple to gain ten or more percent back. I mean, especially there's there's some landowners out there that that are doing their more than their share of mowing during that time, but uh, you were talking about people really key in on not losing a nest to mm -hmm. fire, but the other thing is a lot of folks are, are you know, trying to address, you know, uh, the predation problem with trapping and would be tickled to gain 10% yeah. out of trapping on nest success. But here's a practice that you could pretty easily just don't crank the tractor up and go mow everything down during that time and, and potentially gain that same thing. And, and it's, you know, that that's something that we could all do yeah. really easily and, and potentially make a big impact. Sure. And, and I would strongly recommend both. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. you can easily pick up uh, additional nest success by not mowing and hello during yeah. the, the nesting season. But, but also look, the, the, the big limiting factor that we have easily identified is predators, both mm -hmm. on the nest and, and the poles. I mean, my gosh, uh, that's why we push so hard to allow trapping of, of coons at, at least in the months prior to nesting season and TWRA changed the regulations to allow that year round. Uh, is that going to reduce the statewide coon population? No, but on properties where somebody is interested in turkeys and managing specifically for turkeys, you better believe that you can have an impact on turkey nest success if you go in and, and trap those 
uh, mammalian nest predators in, in the months preceding the, the, uh, the, the nesting season. I mean, working with, with so many properties, we have seen tremendous increases in, in turkey numbers once some, some trapping began to take place. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I know that we've heard that from lots of landowners. And I, as you know, we've gone through trying to characterize the literature on it. And at least for turkeys, the, the data on it is pretty weak. And we were really surprised about that. But uh, you still hear from a lot of landowners that they perceive a, a really high degree of success from trapping. So I'm glad you brought that in. On, on average of... Uh the 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 nests that are preyed upon about 60 percent of those are from mammals and around 10 to 15 percent is is avian mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one thing that i i want to go back to too is we were talking about mowing and the potential effects on nest success by you know just obviously mowing over a nest you have direct destruction but let's even assume that of course you've got nests that are outside of that area um, that was mowed that end up being successful. Well, depending on when that mowing occurs and where you're at, whether all that kind of stuff, um, you may have also taken away some quality brood rearing cover too. Mm -hmm. So not only would you potentially destroy the nests that are directly in that area, but then by mowing, you've taken away cover that poults on down the road would have used, if, especially if early succession yeah. is limiting like it is in most places, mm -hmm. you've well, taken away that, that cover type as well. That's true. Um, that's true also with fire in the woods. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have done so much work with fire and looking at the vegetation response. When you burn in late April and, and early May, it takes that vegetation a long time to respond and get tall enough to provide decent brood cover. Mm -hmm. And so, and all of the work that we've done looking at the timing of fire and especially on vegetation response, whether it's herbaceous or woody, there is virtually no difference with regard to woody resprouting. If you burn during the early portion of the growing season versus if you burn in the dormant season. Mm -hmm. And you may or may not, depending on species, see a little bit of difference if you burn during the mid to latter por portion of the growing season but over time, you certainly can see an impact or influence on plant composition. And so chronic burning during the growing, during the, uh, the dormant season or early growing season in early successional areas, and including, you know, pine savanna and, and pine woodlands, that's going to lead to a predominance of grass, mm -hmm. predominance of grass with, with chronic burning at that time. Whereas if you delay your fire into July, August through October, then you're going to have a much better forb component, a much better forb response later on. So I, I don't prescribe any one strict burning regime uh, for, for sure, but rather to vary your, your timing uh, of, of burning to have as good a plant response with regard to species diversity as, as possible. But to your point, if you burn during the early portion of the growing season, you're not having a, a, po a, a positive effect on, on reducing woody stems any better than you would during the dormant season. And you are delaying that plant response with regard to uh, that providing brood and cover in, in another month or so. Whereas if you burned in, you know, March or early April prior, depending on your latitude, prior to spring green up, then you have fantastic cover for broods where it's available uh in in wooded areas and uh there's not a, a delay in in the in the brood cover that's available there that makes sense yeah and so we keep you keep talking a lot about the importance of grass coverage and having it kind of an optimal range what would you say that is uh for people that are listening that might want to manage these early successional areas for brooding cover well that's something that we have looked at quite a bit and except for a grassland obligate songbird, such as a grasshopper sparrow, an eastern meadowlark, uh, henslow sparrow, etc. I, I, I challenge you to name any species in eastern United States that, that requires, needs, or benefits from more than 30% coverage of grass. 
Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that definitely includes Northern Bob White. And so, uh, these fields, most of them are so chock full of grass that the lowest hanging fruit on the vine for, for folks wanting to improve their fields for, for most wildlife species. And, and again, exception would be the grassland obligate songbirds is to reduce the coverage of grass to not more than 30% and, and have more forb cover and incorporate, of course, both fire, discing, and when needed, herbicide applications to create the, uh, not only influence composition, but also to create the best conditions and structure at ground level. And that's when you'll see increased use of these fields by broods and, and other species. Really good. Yeah. And I mean, the, the point that he made earlier that made me um, think about, you know, the downstream effects of mowing after you, you after mm-hmm. you destroy the nest, taking away that, that brood rearing habitat is, I was working with a landowner not too long ago, um, you know, during the t- time when, you know, poults were just really starting, to, you know, several weeks old, really starting to move around and go to these types of areas. And we were driving around through the property and um, a lot of the food plots were getting mowed during that time of the year. And um, it was something that we had been talking about because there wasn't a lot of other areas that provided opportunity for hens to brood. And we came up, it was like I, I cued it. We came up to this one food plot and it looked kind of weedy and overgrown, but I said, you know, this, this looks better. You know, this is providing some brood rearing cover compared to a lot of the other places on the property, especially the mowed fields. And sure enough, like right on cue, a hen and her brood comes running out of the food plot and crosses <laughs> the road in front of us. So I couldn't have cued that up any well, better if I had tried. This, this is, well, it might, it might be somewhat anecdotal. Uh, we, we haven't, finished the analysis on all this, but on one of the sites, uh, the hens were regularly nesting in the fields that were available on that property. And they were taking their broods over a mile to areas where they would settle into brooding. And uh, the manager of the property, you know, was, you know, kind of surprised, you know, I can't believe that the broods are, are leaving and going as far. And I went out and, and took a took a look and was walking across the property with them. And, you know, I, I, I made the observation, look at, look at the density of the vegetation here. If you were three, four inches tall, where could you go? Where could you walk? Um, you, you can't, you literally could not navigate through these fields. It's so thick. And I said, let's step up in the woods. And you go up into the woods and you can see 120 yards, you know? So what's a poult want to do there? Mm-hmm. Uh, that would yeah. be die. <laughs> and, and so the, the hens were leaving that area, although the nesting cover was good, the brooding cover was, was terrible. And so we began working with the landowner to implement various management practices to improve the composition and structure of these fields. And, you know, for example, Example, one of them was just, you know, chock full of big blue stem, Indian grass, uh, and some switch grass that had been planted. An- another one uh, had, you know, a lot of-, of blackberry, you know, across the field, you know, really, really dense. Uh, there was another one that had a lot of tall fescue, uh, what I call a tall fescue base across the entire field. And so we simply used various herbicide applications to re- reduce the density of native grass. And then of course burned and used plateau pre-emergence to control some incoming vegetation. We got rid of the tall fescue on uh, another field and used some herbicide and, and discing to reduce the amount of, of blackberry in, in the other site. And you know, Shazam, the, the next year, <laughs> they were noticing broods using those fields. And so, you know, it, it isn't like revelational or, or magic. It's just improving the structure and usability of various sites for an animal that's very small and, and they can't get into and use some sites. And then others that they can, if they don't have adequate overhead cover, they're so much more susceptible to predation. And so one of the things that, that you know, we're, we're, noticing is the use of what you should call actual woodlands, you know, 
as a definition, that would be a you know wooded area, an area of trees that has somewhere between 30 to 80 percent canopy cover. And so that's a fairly broad range. And it also should have a herbaceous dominated understory in order to meet the definition of a woodland. And so a forest is not uh, synonymous with woodland. There's, there's a huge difference there. And so what we're seeing is the difference or the effect of different amounts of sunlight coming in on the height of the vegetation in the woodland. And so when you treat these woodlands by killing the trees you don't want and leaving the trees you do want to a certain level, and you have in the neighborhood of 30% sunlight coming in, the height of the vegetation and it's so consistent and, and neat to see is right about the height of a hen's head, you know, on, on average. Mm -hmm. And you've got a nice structure underneath because you're using fire, usually, you know, on average every every two years, you know, anywhere from every one to three years, you're, you're maintaining that site for good brood and cover. And there's excellent cover for broods with regard to overhead cover, but they can move about underneath of it. The hens can see very easy. When you start killing trees or cutting trees such that you get uh, beginning to get about 50 percent sunlight, then that height, it, it blows up and, and it gets to a level to where uh, it is providing more dense cover and it's taller. That structure is, is very good for nesting, but it can be so dense that it's not optimal for, for brooding. And so when you go into a woodlot and you treat it, and you don't try to treat it such that you have, you know, you know, most people will say, oh, I, I want to get 60 percent or I want to get 60 uh, square feet of basal area per acre. I, I am not I am not at all interested in basal area. I'm interested in, in the amount of sunlight coming in. And it's good to have variable amounts. Uh, we call that variable retention. And so you go in and kill trees that you don't want, leave ones that you do. Well, there may be areas that uh, I, I don't like most of these. So I'm going to kill or, or cut most of them down or, you know, usually kill them to let them fall apart slowly. And in another area, man, most of these trees are great. And so leave them. And so you have a varying amount of cover, both with regard to density and height in your woods. And you can see the birds responding to that where they might nest more in these thick areas, but they will go to these, you know, thinner, uh, less, tall understory areas for, for brooding. And, and they, are, they are using these areas uh, really, really well. And it's simply going from unmanaged woods to a woodland that you are reducing canopy cover and using prescribed fire to influence the composition and the structure of, of the understory. And, and the birds really respond to it. Mm -hmm. And, and in, fact, I, in fact, I would consider that if some if someone had to press me and say, what would you consider the single best vegetation type for wild turkeys? That's what I would say, an, an open woodland with variable retention. You've got nesting cover, brooding cover, loafing cover. There's forage in the summer. There's mast in, in the fall, winter, obviously roost sites. Pretty much everything a turkey needs is, is in that. And when that is interspersed across the property and the openings are managed as they should be for turkeys. And then on top of that, you implement some uh, amount of trapping to reduce these animals that are eating the, the eggs and the poach, you're going to see a response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that sounds really similar, similar to the, um, the story that Dwayne Elmore just shared mm -hmm. in one of our recent previous episodes where he talked about doing that on his Georgia property. Yeah, he, he kind of described a situation where he'd done everything he could think of from a habitat standpoint and then uh, implemented trapping on, you know, at, once he got once he got to a point where he didn't know how to improve the habitat any more than he already had. Mm -hmm. He implemented trapping and that was the same. He told the same story that he saw that augment the, the habitat work on his property. <clears throat> and and. That is not easy to capture in a study, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, the best studies have lots of sites. There, yep. There's lots of replication. Yep. And getting the landowners or even the state agencies to implement the recommendations that you would like to include in the study design 
that is very, very difficult. It's, it's yeah. not easy to we, get all of that habitat management specifically for turkeys done and in uh, a certain amount of intensity that, that is needed because of all kinds of restraints, whether mm -hmm. it's time, financial, equipment, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so I will say a, a lot of that information comes from working with so many property owners that have done that. And, you know, I, I can't necessarily point you to a journal article on, on every mm -hmm. one of those, but uh, when, when you implement the correct amount of, of predator control, I'll say, in with your habitat management work, it, it will pay dividends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's kind of where we... With, with, with regard to turkeys, for yeah. sure. Well, we've talked about that quite a bit on the other episodes where we've had a whole segment on trapping, which, you know, when we're giving the perspective from the literature, we're, it's underwhelming because there's so little to to base it on, but we've also tried to uh, couch it within this context that that there are a lot of landowners that that have engaged really with really aggressive habitat work and trapping and they tell that same story uh you know and and uh, we've also leaned somewhat on the quail literature which has right. has uh some better data to suggest that when you have habitat in order that you can see dividends from the trapping and this kind of where we're at and and uh, we've also talked about all those limitations and difficulties and designing a study like that and that really is kind of a dream uh, sounds like of, of both will and I, at least uh, and a dream that, study that to do that long term is that is something that uh hopefully we are about to implement on some of these sites and uh so, something to keep in mind i got to tennessee in, in 1998 TWRA had just stopped the raccoon restoration work in the <laughs> mid-1990s. In 1998 and 1999, we were still documenting every raccoon that we saw run over on the roads, obviously, and reporting that to show how the raccoon population was uh, responding and expanding. <laughs> well, I think it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, there's coons everywhere. And and it's a huge limiting factor. Mm. And, so, and and skunks and coyotes and and uh you know in some areas armadillas, for example. But uh yeah, controlling those is is very much needed on, on many properties. So does that mean that Craig that we uh we partially have you to thank for the numbers of coons that are currently in Tennessee? No, all I was doing was marking down where I saw them as I, you know, tried to when steer you swerved away to from them. them hint, hint, <laughs> <and the roses. laughs> so, yeah, you, you'd swerve over to hit and be like, well, there was one. <laughs> we don't know why Craig just keeps getting the highest Craig, counts of all these yeah. roadkill dogs, he's got all these roadkill coons. He's got 12 times the, <laughs> the number of anybody else. Half of these reports are from the same person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all. That's all good stuff. I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. Um, is there anything else? Any burning questions you don't feel like we've gotten to? Or well, I I, I think uh, Craig, you, you're uh, obviously the the expert on a lot of this stuff, and and uh, have tons of experience working with a lot of people in a lot of places. Uh, are there any? strong take-home messages that that uh you'd like to tell people i guess trying to circle one back to this this issue with the the season frameworks is there anything you know that you you think is a, a good take home for them to think about well all all i can speak to of course is is what we have done here in in, in tennessee you know i i haven't analyzed data from from other sites with regard to uh, turkey numbers or, or harvest and, and season dates, but we we haven't seen an effect of moving the the opening day of turkey season back in in Tennessee. But that doesn't mean it couldn't have an effect somewhere. I know in Florida where we had a graduate student working at tall timbers and looking at goblin chronology and nest initiation and and thinking of of when 
uh, most nests were uh, the peak nest initiation. We recommended setting the season back in, in that scenario, any, anywhere from one to three weeks, according to where the state agency wanted the, uh, the season opener to fall, whether it was at peak goblin or at peak uh, nest initiation. So there, there certainly could be some cases in which that is needed. And I know also on some WMAs, for example, 80% of the gobblers killed on that WMA may be killed on opening weekend. Now, is that a problem? Absolutely, that's, that's got to be a problem. Uh, I, I would like to see more documentation of the effect of, of moving these, these season dates, but even on WMAs where 80% of the birds are killed on opening weekend, does that mean that the season needs to be set back to ameliorate that? I, I think that's simply bad management. Uh, they need to implement on some of those areas, whether it be quota permits or, or you know, spreading out hunter effort. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you're going to have a, a negative effect by opening the season at that time. But if you're opening it up to everybody and you have hunting pressure great enough such that you're killing 80 percent of the birds that are going to be harvested during the opening weekend, Certainly, that, that could be a, a huge problem. And so I think there are multiple things here that, that obviously should be uh, discussed and addressed. And the answer to all of those may be different. You know, it, it's not just one single thing that is the, 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 the answer here. And with regard to the decline in that south middle portion of, of Tennessee, uh, we have not noticed any effect of disease, you know, Rick Gerhold is is leading the uh, the disease component of, of the project. And with all of the hunter killed birds that we get our hands on, all of any other dead birds that we get our hands on and blood samples from the, the birds that we trap, uh, they have looked at all of that and have found no disease, whether it be blackhead or, or any other problem that may be uh, influencing the the turkey numbers or, or harvest rate uh down in that area the, the the smoking gun is is primarily the the predators both nest predation and and poke survival they're they're relatively low and that's what's driving the relatively low fecundity or you know addition into the fall population in, in those areas and of course habitat work can be done on all of these areas to, to help improve conditions such that you may see increased nest or, or brood survival. And certainly you can influence habitat use by your management. It's good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I think we've pretty well covered a variety of topics, not just the, the season date, but a whole bunch of other great information. Anything else? You well, there's to no way we're not going to also get into habitat when the three of us start talking. Uh, so, no. well, I'll, I mean, most of my thought process has been influenced by Craig on that. Uh, so, I always want to hear him talk about it. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. absolutely. Uh, and, we, and Craig, we definitely want to have you back if you're if you're still willing and and able to come on and tell us you know, what we need to know about habitat. We're going to have several well, episodes on, on that topic. Y'all just so. keep the checks coming in the mail and I'll, I'll show up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, uh, for the listeners, that is a big joke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he, he may want to wait get, a few I months. Get nothing, I get nothing from these guys except a hard time. That's for sure. <laughs> and that's been for more than a decade now. <laughs> Maybe a good nothing, time every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know you've gotten a few laughs from it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, we really appreciate you again taking the time. And, and it's always really fun to see you and talk to you. And, and uh, I'll, I always learn a ton every time I, I listen to you, you know, tell me how well, things are. So. Ple pleasure's mine. I always enjoy visiting with you. And we always have a good time. Yeah. He may want to wait a few months to come back on to see if more than five people listen to this yeah. and, and then make a determination from yeah, there. Yeah, all, all, all three of our listeners really appreciate it too, Craig. <laughs> well, 
I, I will say that unfortunately, and, and I, I don't know if you want to get into this, but you know, the, the TWRA commissioners voted this past spring to implement this season delay throughout the state. So the Tennessee statewide season will not begin until mid April. So I'm thinking early April now might be a great time to come down to Alabama and sit there in person with you on the podcast. And uh, <laughs> we can do some other things as well. That, that does sound like pretty good time. I think we can arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Well, uh, again, thanks everybody out there for listening. Uh, we appreciate all the support and, you know, help us share the podcast, go rate it, do all those things that help us get this word out here. Hopefully, uh, with information like what you've provided, Craig, we can have a, a positive impact on turkeys in general, and that's what this is all about. So uh, we're trying to do our part, and hopefully our listeners will help us as well to, to extend the word out as far as possible. So thanks, everybody. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Very good. Thank you all. Wild Turkey Science is sponsored by Turkeys for Tomorrow and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. For more information, follow us on social media linked in the show notes below.